Um, it was a great show. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's been a two years since I saw you guys last time in Czech Republic yeah, at the Euro Hall in 2010. And before that, I went to see you guys in. Uh, yeah, I really like the show there too. And I um, think this is the third time in Japan for you guys. Yes, yes. Yeah, I think the first one because I was in California and I'm the second one because I was in Florida. <laughs> so this is my first time oh, see, to see you guys live. Oh, that's awesome. And so it was my that's great experience and I yeah, heard it. Good show. So, the audience was yeah, so you know, good. Yeah. 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 I think it was even better than last time. Oh yeah, yeah. it's like, yeah, it was, it was awesome. I know there are more, more than seven hundred people. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 So uh God damn it. I've been a big fan of Kendall Fox for a very long time since I was a high school kid. Um, well, let me introduce myself. My stage name is Dr. McCannibal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> name myself after you guys' dance name. Oh, everybody. So, what, what, whose idea of your band name, kind of, of is the name? Yeah, that was my yeah. idea. And I was just thinking, um, you know, when we were making the band, we wanted the name to have something to do with horror. Mm -hmm. and to be, you know, we knew we were going to be a death metal band when we were making the band. So. Um, we're just thinking of things, and um, I've been watching a lot of zombie movies and things mm -hmm. like that. All of us in the band had, and just mm -hmm. thought of those words, cannibal and corpse. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that just it just sounded good together because of the C and the, the other, you know, two C's together sounds good, cannibal and corpse. Mm -hmm. you know? So I, I introduced it to the other guys in band practice, and they said they liked it, so we kept the name. I'd like to ask you about the latest album, Torture. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, making a great album. I really loved it. And I felt that this um, latest new album is have a rich variety of songs. That's what I felt first uh, when I heard it, the album. So was that um, something you had in your mind when you were started making the song? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think. Um to make an album that's really interesting, it's important for each song to stand on its own and to have um, something about it that has its own character. And that's what we tried to do with this album. And there's a number of different ways you can achieve that, you know, by having maybe a different scale, you know, to give a different tonality from song to song. Like one, for example, the song Rabbit, I use the augmented scale throughout it, and then and, um, like the strangulation chair is mostly diminished. So those kind of things you think about and then thinking about different rhythms, different tempos, all those things can give each song its own character and then it makes it interesting to listen to the whole album. It's not just one song after the other that all sounds kind of the same. Yeah, those songs that you just mentioned, Sandra's chair, and whatever, I was just going to say that uh, I've had a feeling of, you know, watching a horror movie or something, I felt really scared. Um, oh, well, if, well, I just want to ask you if you have a influence, any influence from horror movies and stuff like that. Sure, I think everybody in you know, yeah. the band likes horror movies mm -hmm. to an uh, extent, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know. Murder cases, little murder cases. Um, I know, not yeah. we, we do watch like Mystery Channel, there's a lot of, you know, notorious, you know, things about, you know, famous murders, things like that, you know. I think most of our lyrics are more fictional, you know. Um, obviously, some of the things could happen that are happening in there, but, you know, we have some of the zombies which are obviously not real, you know, and whatnot. So, um, there's stories about real, you know, any something that could actually happen, but a lot, and there's a lot about, I think it's a good mix of fiction and, Non-fiction, but nothing. I don't think, at least from you yeah, know, right, that's based on anything that's really happened. That's just a made-up story. Yeah, yeah, I think. Yeah. yeah, as opposed to saying maybe the words fiction and non-fiction, it's all fictional, mm -hmm. meaning that none of it's true, none of it's things that actually happened. But some of them are things that could happen, like that involve you know deaths that, that happen by natural causes. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody murdering someone else with a knife. That's normal. That can, that can happen. Where a, a, an attack by something supernatural. Mm -hmm. We have songs like that too, and that's more of a fantasy kind of horror. 
So we like to have both of those, a more realistic kind of horror and a more um, fantastic kind of horror that's mm -hmm. supernatural and a little more surreal. I, I like both kinds mm -hmm. of horror. Well, how does it relate with your real, uh, you know, emotional feelings? How, how your, you know, your personality or your feelings affect your music? I think just mainly with the lyrics, we're trying to make them to be a good complement to the music that we're writing. Mm -hmm. And the music itself, with or without lyrics, is more, at least on my part, it's where the real emotion comes in. Mm -hmm. You know, the lyrics are, I do put a lot of work into the lyrics that, I, that I'll write, you know, and I'm sure the other guys for the songs they're writing are working hard on them too. But the most, of, I can get a lot of emotion just out of music without lyrics at all, mm -hmm. you know. And that's, it's all like, you know, if, if we're trying to write something that sounds dark, you know, I think about something dark. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even have to really be a particular thing, just mm -hmm. to try and conjure a dark feeling. And then with something aggressive, like a song like Time to Kill Is Now, mm -hmm. that song I was just thinking about, like, when you're really angry, like when you're about to fight or something like that, like that kind of a feeling, I wanted that in that music. Mm -hmm. So that, I think that the music, it sounded, it sounded aggressive without even having the lyrics be aggressive. And that was, the, the, so the emotion got put into the music first and foremost, and then the lyrics were like meant to complement the music. Uh, we've been working with Eric Hurtin from uh, Eight Eternal, Emerson Albums. So what made you work with him in the beginning? How did it start? Do you want to take this question? Or? Hey, we've all known Eric for a long time. Mm -hmm. Through you know Ripping Corpse and, and you know Morbid Angel and whatnot, and you know we knew you know that he had the studio going, and I actually recorded a record there just mm -hmm. before we did uh, Kill the, the Pez Possession. Mm -hmm. It was just before it, but I mean I think we, we were already going there one way or the other. Um, so you know, I mean, you know, Alex and him are like best friends. You know what I mean? And and. Uh, oh, and, so you were um, I've done two recordings with Kate Eternal, yeah, so I, and you know, me and Eric, <coughs> Morbid Angel, Soundman, Punch, we all shared a house for a year or so, you know, so we, we've just been really close friends. I, I played in um, Eric Rutan's other band, Alas, it's like a melodic metal band. Mm -hmm. I did a couple shows with them and did some demo recordings, so, you know, we're very close friends. He's one of my very best friends, and so there's that relationship, but on top of it, we know you know, we wouldn't hire someone just because we're friends with them. We hired him because we knew he could do the job and, and do it as well as anyone in the business. You know, he's he's a guy who's at the top level of death metal guitar, and he's also at the top level of death metal production. Mm -hmm. So you have both of those things. So um, a lot of there's a lot of great producers, but very few of them I can't think of any are also you know at the top of our field the way he is. So he's ex super experienced. In, bo in both of those things, in death metal. Yeah, he's just a death metal guy. He's a great singer, too. It's, yeah, yeah, I totally enjoy working with him. He knows, you know, all the nuances and whatnot. So when I'm working with him singing, you know, he hears things that I don't hear. I mean, I hear things he doesn't hear, but it's someone that I know that's not going to let anything slip. Like, I won't let things slip. I'm anal about, you know, a lot of stuff when it comes to doing the vocals. So I appreciate having someone there that obviously has been in my shoes on stage in the studio. You know, as far as you know, singing goes, you know, and it's it's um, blast work. You know, it's fun. Yeah, I, I, I I know I drive insane sometimes because I fuck around a lot. Well, if I get frustrated, and this is one good thing too about him, when I'm frustrated, he'll be like, no, 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 no. just do it again, you know. And I'll do it again, but I'll do it like ridiculous. I'll do the whatever part we're all working on. I'll do some like. Ah, or something, you know, and he's like, he'll start laughing, I'll laugh, it just makes everything that much better, and I'll probably do it one too many times and say, all right, come on, come on, I gotta get this done, you know, I'm just, all right, so I'll do it again, he'll laugh, and I'll say, all right, seriously, but it, it's the best time for me working with him just because there's times where I'm just like, I just want to walk out of the studio, right out of the booth, and just not sing anymore. And he keeps me like you know focused and makes it fun at the same time. He's he's really good at you know working like that. And obviously, because he's been in my shoes, he knows you know. Mm -hmm. And for you know for instruments, you know same thing. And mm -hmm. obviously, he knows Gandhi and pretty much everything there is in the studio. And and so, you know, when you listen to the music that he makes, mm -hmm. and the time and effort he puts into it, 
and then you listen to the records that he's done with bands at just even outside of us and the time and effort he puts into it. Yeah, I love working with him. I mean, I love doing vocals with him. Um, it's the most fun I've probably ever had you know, doing the vocals with any, with any of the people that we work with. And that's no offense to the other guys, you know, but just because I know he's, you know, understands more than anybody. It's been um, difficult for music business these days because people don't buy CDs. Um, or how, how do you feel that your latest album ranks 33rd of sales chart? Yeah, yeah, I think it was yeah, 33 or 38 or something like that. Yeah, it made it into the top 40 on the Billboard 200. It feels really good, and I think it shows, um, probably shows a few different things. I think mm -hmm. you see a lot more extreme metal bands charting higher on the charts. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily selling a whole lot more than they used to, um, although metal in general might be getting a little bigger in America, but I think one of the, um, the big things is that it's... Um, it shows that metal fans buy albums, and a lot of these other bands that used to be dominant, their fans aren't as loyal. They don't care about buying an album. Like, I don't know if a person who likes a dance music band really cares to have the CD in his hand, but I know most Cannibal Corpse fans want the CD in their hand. They want to look at the package. So I think proportionately more of our fans, a higher percentage of our fans probably buy albums than a fan of a band that's much more popular and mainstream. So that enables us to chart higher than you'd expect. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you're comfortable with it, now I would like to ask you about some member changes in the past. Well, I heard that Chris Barnes was fired because he was spending too much time on uh, side projects like 1600. No, it, it really, there was a number. I mean, there were definitely some personal difficulties we had with mm -hmm. him. Gotta remember at that time we were all fairly young guys, you know, and it's, you, you tend to, um, have a hard time getting along with each other when you're younger, you know. And but on top of that, really, it just we had some personal difficulties, but we were getting along quite well at the time that we asked him to leave the band. You know, we just weren't really happy with how things were sounding anymore. You know, like the way the vocals were coming out on the album that, that became vile. It was originally going to be called Created to Kill, but. We just weren't happy with how those vocals were coming along. He was he's a fairly stubborn guy, you know, I think he'll admit to that, and I don't mean it as an insult, you know, but he um, he did not want to change anything, so um, we said, man, this is this time for it to end, you know, we want to get a different singer. So he was pretty cordial about it, and he already had six feet undergoing. Um, I mean, it did not help that he had gone away on tour, like he had a tour scheduled right in the middle of the recording session, you know, so that, during that time, when, yeah, he, he got a few of the songs done, but we were having so much trouble working with him that he wasn't finished with his singing before he went on tour. I guess the original idea was he'd finish the singing and go on tour while the rest of us finished our stuff. Mm -hmm. It didn't work out that way. He um, went away on tour during that time. You know, this is back before any of us had cell phones or anything. We got George to come down and started working with him once Chris was on tour in the middle of the session we started rewriting lyrics and we'd already made up our mind and then once Chris got home I called his house and told him what was going on. You know. But he was okay because he already had six feet under ready to go. So probably would have been more angry if he didn't have a solid band already <laughs> ready to go into, you know. But he's still okay about it. You know, I think anytime you're having that many problems, the other person's probably feeling a lot of stress too. Mm -hmm. So it might have been a good situation for us to break apart at that time. So it wasn't a uh, really, you know, big decision, a very difficult decision to make to it wasn't, and you know, a part of the reason it wasn't difficult is because, again, you're young and you don't think about how serious a decision it is. We're like, oh yeah, you know, we're not happy with him. Um, we've been having some too many problems. Let's get him out and get George in, and and we didn't think, oh, maybe a whole bunch of people won't like that decision or whatever. We just wanted, we knew that was what we wanted to do. It would be. Um, a lot harder for us to make such a drastic decision now that we're older, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, but when you're young, you just, you're just like, fuck it. You just want to yeah, do yeah. what what's oh, right yeah. immediately for your music, and you don't really care about the repercussions. Mm -hmm. 
So you were also young, so you didn't feel any pressures or anything. For me? Yeah. <laughs> All right, if, if I'm going to be honest about it, you know, I, obviously it's a big deal. I mean, you know, you're talking the biggest death would have been out there. At the time, you know, they're, you know what I mean, easily the biggest death would have been, you know what I mean? And so, you know, when Alex called me, I was like, wow, holy shit. <laughs> well, when he first called me, I, I you know, when I talked to him on the phone, he said, it's not from Cattle. I was like, oh, boy. Well, Holy shit! Because there's, I mean, I knew Alex, but I didn't know him that well. I knew Rob very well for a lot of years when I was in Monstrosity. He played shows with us, so Rob would call me. I mean, I would have believed him. I knew that they were having you know, some issues. You know what I mean? But um, I would believe Rob. But I, it's immediately when Alex said, "Hey, this is Alex McCannable," I was like, "Oh shit!" I knew what was coming. There's no other reason he would call me. Now, I mean, yeah, we I could have been wrong, you know, but. Yeah, we I weren't close assumed. enough friends to just be calling yeah, each other. Yeah, on the phone. yeah, I, I, I we knew I mean, each other. Yeah, yeah, I met him, you know, I mean, we, you know, we actually, Monstrosity played a show in, in Tampa, uh, and those guys were there. They just moved down, I think, not, not too long before. And sure, there's like pressure, obviously, you know. I mean, I, I do remember being in the studio, and we were doing like the higher screen stuff, like mm -hmm. Development Vermin, and it wasn't really sounding real good. And I remember I just took a break, went to the bathroom, and just, as Hollywood as it sounds, I'm not lying. I was like, dude, don't, no, you can't fuck this up, man. Fuck this, you know you can do this. And so once we did the album, that was that. I didn't feel any pressure live. I knew what I, I did live, you know. But it's not up to me, you know. I can only do what I do, and then, you know, do the album how I would, you know what I mean, and we all work together, you know what I mean, to, to, to get it done, make it as good as possible, and then live, it was when people first see it, or when they heard the album too, but I think live is one of the biggest ways for a band to come across to people that, they're, that aren't familiar with them, or, or if you're like a new person, you know what I mean, especially a singer, because yeah. You know, it's unfortunate that most people look at just the singer as the focal mm -hmm. point, but that's just how it is. And you know, when you replace the singer, it's a big deal. You know what I mean? So, so especially because you know, a voice is a little more individual in some things. You know. And anyway, I wasn't. I I, gotta, I was like, I'm gonna kill these five kids. I'm gonna let them. I'm gonna show them what I can do. I had a chip on my shoulder. I really did. But it's of course, you know. <laughs> It's still not up to me. You can be the greatest in the world and no one ever cares and then you're gone you know, next year. So I just asked, you know, really like in my mind I was like, well, when we're playing shows, just give me a chance. Just watch the show. Sure, it might be different than what Chris did. People were really, you know, liked his voice and, and his stage presence and the things he said on stage and whatnot. And and I'm gonna be totally different than that. But just at least Try to accept that it is still death metal. You know, we, we, we didn't, you know they, they change styles. I think I sing faster parts than he does. That's the, one of the things that they in me saw. You know what I mean? I do a lot more higher stuff. You know what I mean? In mid and whatever. So, with all that said, it was still up to the fans, and they, you know, every single well. But I, I felt pressure to, to just all right, just go down and kick their ass, and that's that. But. Honestly, I, I had a chip on my shoulder here too. I said, like, I'll fucking show these people right now. I'll show them. That, you know what I mean? I can, you know what I mean? I was content on making them forget bars. You know, as mean as that sounds, and Chris is really cool, and we're friends and whatnot, so I don't mean it bad, but, you know, I was intent on making the world forget it. Because obviously, I mean, he was a big deal. I mean, you know, this guy's one of the, you know, greatest death row singers. You know, at the time, everyone was, you know, you know, it was a big deal. I mean, it really was. Even, even when I knew they had problems, but I knew when they booted him, I was like, wow, man, this is a big deal. And it really was at the time. I mean, it was really like a shocker, I think, for a lot of people. So, like, pressure in some ways, yes, but at the same time, fucking show that. I mean, that's just, well, yeah. I was 25 years old, you know. <laughs> I get a little upset, you know, understanding how you feel, because I joined Psy. So we in, in 2007 or something, and you know, to me, I was already a big band, and it was a really big deal. And uh, he was the main singer, and then I, now I take the half vocal and I play saxophone, and I'm you know, in the share the middle of the stage. Oh, it's gonna close. It wants to go. Oh wow. Um, um, what? <laughs> <laughs> what band is it? Um, so, anyways, I had that pressure too. Yeah, yeah when I first joined. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because you, you can believe in yourself all you want. It's still, you know, yeah, I mean, you can, we can release a new album and 
we can think it's the greatest album we've ever made, it's still up, you know, I mean, to the fans. But I think that obviously when they listen to it, they hear the effort, you know, they know. You see it live, you know, from, from everyone, you know what I mean? Not just like me, you know what I mean? I mean, because <clears throat> in my mind, I was like, well, listen, listen to the fucking album anyway, and just forget the vocals for a second. I mean, it's. It, I mean, I know it's a big deal. It's a, a new singer, but that this doesn't change the music. The music was was there. That's the music that was going to be there, one way or the other. You know. So it was like, listen to Count of Course's new album, and realize, take the vocals away, and realize, well, they're still a new band. You know, and if you don't enjoy the the, the my style of singing more, then okay, that's fair enough. But you know, then you're just making it. I like Chris or George, not just the band. In you know what I mean? Just believe in those guys too. If you like mm -hmm. Count Corpse, and you should, you know, you should say, I like, I, I still go like the music. Yeah. Those guys have kick ass, and their music's yeah. been great. All, you know, that was definitely something that annoyed us a little bit, and we did not really realize um, just how much some people really are just a fan of a singer as opposed to being a fan of a band. Yeah, you know? um, yeah. Because I was like, oh well, nobody's going to mind that much because eighty percent of the band is still the same people. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Okay. But there were there were some people that that were you know upset that we got rid of Chris. But you got like I said, you, you really just you have to do what's right for your music in your mind. You know, and that was what was right for the music. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, when Jack Owen left the band, he said, uh, "Boy, if I work, he said he had no more passion to play death metal. Uh, I can't." Totally understand it because when I was on tour, at the end, toward the end of the tour, I got really sick and tired of you know playing the same set every night. And, you know, then um, well, my question was, I'm just wondering how you keep yourself motivated playing the same style. I mean, every night's yeah. a different crowd, a different reaction, a different mm -hmm. city, a different place. There's a lot of different things going on just outside just before you even get on stage. You know, you could be in a place where there's nothing around. You could be in the middle of nowhere playing a club that's just yeah. on the outskirts of town. You could be in the middle of a great city with a mall and things to do. And then when you get on stage, sure, you're playing the same set, but it's always a different crowd. You know, some nights they're stage diving more, some nights they're headbanging more, they're slamming more, they're louder when they're after each song. Yeah, every night's a little different. It's just a little different, you know, just from the crowd perspective. The crowd, I think, is a big thing that dictates, for me, like, the crowd is going crazy, and you're just tired. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, oh, I'm not tired of this shit. So I just think that much. And you walk on stage. Mm -hmm. the power from the and goosebumps. It's like it's the greatest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. When you walk on stage and that crowd goes crazy, it's the it's incredible. Mm -hmm. And bam, immediately you're like, okay. So you don't even think about it's the same set. I mean, you know, it's just okay. We're playing this song. We're going to play these songs. Okay, it's three in a row. It's two in a row. You know, I think I focus more on how the crowd is, you know what I mean? And obviously playing the songs, you know, but I think most of us are on autopilot like playing the songs. Not that it's like the easiest thing or anything, but you start just going through the motions, you're doing it. There's times I know where people have like come on stage and bumped into me and I'm like, man, how did I remember to be in time? But it's just natural after just you play all these shows. So I don't mind it being the same set, you know? Uh, it's just, it's a different crowd. And that is, to me, what makes each show different, you know? Because obviously the set's the same. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, too, like, just as far as in continuing to enjoy death metal and be inspired by it, it's my favorite kind of music. I still, to me, it's still the best kind of heavy metal. I love all different kinds of heavy metal, like mm -hmm. regular classic metal, and, you know, thrash and all. Black metal, all different kinds of metal is killer, but death metal is my favorite kind. So I'm playing my favorite kind of music, and really what we like to do is, you know, every after every tour we might change a couple songs in the set, that sort of thing. If we're getting a little bored with one or two of them, we'll switch some up. But in general, it's just it's a lot of fun, and we've got a lot of songs to choose from. So the set we played tonight, for example, it's all a bunch of songs all of us really like. So it's fun. And we do listen. I mean, there are a lot of times over the course of, especially like a tour, like a U.S. or European tour, where it's 30 shows or, or more. You know, we're hearing people yelling for certain songs that maybe we haven't played in a while, and we are always thinking about it. You know, okay, there's some songs we're just not really wanting to play for whatever reason. But when you hear it enough times, like we went, to, we hadn't played "Fuck Your Life" for a long time, and now we have it back on this tour. 
Obviously, we're, we really are. I mean, it's hard to always hear everything everyone's saying in between a song here. I'm just trying to get a drink of water and wipe my face off. But, you know, everybody's got their own little thing they're doing in between the songs. But you do hear them sometimes because I'll say to Paul, like, hey, dude, like tonight, there's some guy yelled for a book that was broke. I remember it, you know. I remember that. And that's not saying that we're going to play it just because of that. But if you know, enough people are screaming for the songs, you know, we want to give them what they want, you know, as long as it's something we want to do. Let me break in here. Are we out of time? <laughs> the last question. Last yeah. question. We have all the time we want. You no, can't stop us. Also need us to get out of the building. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> I haven't had enough beer. A uh, message to Japanese fans? That would be my last question. Thanks for the support. Stay yeah, well. Thank you so much to everybody who came out to see us play and everybody who supports us here. It's yeah. a fucking it's great awesome show. Thank it was. You. It really was a great show. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thanks so much for the interview. Awesome. Thank you. Okay.